of the universe. As we look at the stars on a cloudless night, our eyes only see a fraction, just a sampling of what is actually out there beyond us. Billions of galaxies swirling with stars. Our universe, in a word, is huge. scriptures say that God brought the stars into existence with a word, with just the exhale of a breath. It says that God measures the universe with the span of his hand. So how big does that make God? And how small does that make us? It's hard to comprehend such scale evokes awe and wonder, but it also brings thoughts of a distant God, a million miles away, a giant God who cannot be bothered with the details of our lives. But perhaps the wonder of God lies not just in his bigness, but it lies also in his smallness. The same God who set the earth in motion around the sun is the same God who put particles in motion around a nucleus. The same God that swirled the galaxies created swirls on the tips of your fingers. The same God that created this massive universe is the same God who sent a tiny little to save it. God's Son stepped out of heaven. His love demonstrated by the distance he was willing to travel from heaven to cross, from joy to pain, from life to death. He became like us. He became small Son of heaven rose 
Good morning, church. Great to see you today. What a beautiful Sunday morning here in Irving, Texas. We welcome folks that are watching by live stream locally or from folks and friends and family around the country. We're just very glad you're joining us today for our worship service this morning. Let me begin by opening in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this glorious day you've given to us as a gift, a gift to use for you and for your glory and honor. And Father, we pray that we would do just that. We thank you that we can gather freely in this place this morning and ask, Lord, that you would bless this time. We are honored by your presence. We pray, Father, that you will fill this place with power from your spirit, that we would learn of you and grow in you and love you all the more. Thanks, Father, for the good work you're doing in our lives, in our church. We ask, Father, your blessing in the things that uh, we do and pray that we'd walk in your ways and humble ourselves before you. Father, you know the challenging times in which we live and those issues and concerns are ever, ever on the forefront of our minds. And so we bring those before your, your throne of grace and ask for your mercy, your guidance, your healing of our land, both uh, physically with the coronavirus and then relationally, Father, with the, the strife that we're seeing. We thank you so much, Lord, that your plans are good and that we can rest in you, that uh, there's nothing happening in the world today that a wonderful, mighty wave of revival wouldn't heal and solve. So, Father, we surrender to you and thank you that you're Lord of all and pray your blessing again on this time. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, good morning again and welcome to our worship service. We're glad you're here and glad you're joining us again by live stream. Uh, uh, just uh, two or three announcements very quickly. The first is there is a board meeting tonight with our board. We're actually going to meet live in person for the first time in three or four months. Social distancing in the fellowship all spread out by 10 feet or whatever, but uh, uh, it will actually be good to see their face and see facial expressions and countenance and not just uh, a little square on a box on our laptop or whatever. Um, also, our youth have been on a mission trip to Colorado and that is uh, coming to a close. They'll return either today or tomorrow, I think tomorrow, but we uh, will welcome them back and we're excited to see them and, and hear how the trip went and all that God did um, in, in their uh, acts of service as they worked with missions agencies like World Venture and other groups and churches on their trip and also just had marvelous times with God out in nature and enjoying uh, the beauty of his creation. And then also this morning, we are just thrilled to have the Berkeys with us today. David and Jereen are here, and they're going to give a presentation here in a little bit uh, about their ministry, their lives, things happening in Venezuela, how their kids are doing, and we look forward to getting an update on all of that. But welcome to church this morning. So glad to have you. They are, they are home from Venezuela. The mission board has called them and the Engels and others home, and uh, as, they're, as the world is going through this pandemic, uh, so they are... Uh, 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 headquartered out of the Phoenix and Tucson area in Arizona, and they'll be sharing all about that as well, I'm sure. But uh, those are the announcements for the day. Let's enjoy worshiping together as Jason and his family lead us so well. Thank you. Before I have you stand, let's uh, let's let's say a word a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, we we worship you with um, with our whole hearts. Now we recognize that we have come together for uh, a reason, uh, and you have brought us together for a reason. Even those who are online watching, um, they are watching for a, a reason and joining us in that way. Father, we pray that um, by your Spirit you would unite us wherever we are that you would allow us to worship you in spirit and in truth, that as our thoughts and our voices raise to you and our eyes raise to you, Lord, that you would um, help us to see and glimpse something of your character or of your truth that uh, maybe we haven't seen before. And, and in that, bring us along in our relationship with you, furthering our trust, deepening our faith, helping us take that step that we knew we needed to take, but we haven't yet. Give us the strength and power to do that by your spirit, and as we sing together, I pray that you would cause your peace to uh, cover us all, that your grace would be known, and your love would be known. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You would stand.
Let's sing this together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the John 4, 23 through 24. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. When the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's a word That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in 
is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. Seventeen through 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. I come, God, I come. I return to the Lord, the one who's broken, the one who's torn me apart. You strike down and bind me up. You say you do it all in love. That I might know you in your suffering. Though you slay me, yet I will praise you. Though you take from me, I will bless your name. all I need. My heart and flesh may fail, the earth below give away, but with my eyes, with my eyes I'll see the Lord. Lifted high beyond that day, behold the Lamb that was laid, and I know every fear was worth it all. And though you slay me, yet I will praise you. Though you take from me, I will bless your name. Though you ruin me, still I will worship, sing a song. 
What can we say to describe just a glimpse of your glory? How can our words portray but a thread of your majesty? Father in heaven, we know that there is no way that we can really describe, really say, really express with our words how great that you are. As an infinite and holy God, you you are far beyond our imagination and our capacity really to to understand you fully in in your fullness. Yet we rejoice in the fact that, God, you have revealed yourself to us just as you wished And you've revealed yourself to us in a way that we can know you. And and even though that you are an eternal, infinite God and we are finite uh, beings whom you have created, God, you have made us, um, you've made us so that we might have a relationship with you. And and that means knowing you. That, That means trusting you. That means knowing you well enough to know that, God, you are trustworthy and good all the time. And so we turn our attention uh, to you in, in our worship here now. And as, just as we, as we listen to your word, as we hear how you're working around the world, uh, Father, we know that, that you see uh, all of your creation, you see all of your people, you see every bit of the suffering, every bit of, of the struggle that uh, your people go through, whether big or small. And, and you know every, every number, you know the number of every, every hair of, of each one of our heads, and, and, and that's astounding that you would know us that intimately. And so, Father, we, we acknowledge your greatness and your holiness. We acknowledge your, your majesty and your power to cover and encompass and see and, and hold all things together. But in this silence, may our hearts trust In your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We do have a very special treat this morning. David and Jereen Berkey are here uh, serving with World Venture in Venezuela. We have known this couple and their children well for many decades. They were part of our church life 
when David was attending Dallas Theological Seminary, and he actually led in worship uh, during those years here. And uh, they have served <laughs> all these years in Venezuela with World Ventures, served sacrificially, served marvelously with uh, the beauty of Jesus shining through their lives. And uh, they've had a, a tremendous impact and uh, fascinating stories of how God had used, has used them and the journey that they've been on. And they've raised beautiful children who love Jesus, and it's just a joy to hear from them today. We welcome David and Jereen to our worship service this morning. Well, good morning. It is great to be here with you, those who are here in person and those who are watching online. And we have such a special place in our heart for Community Bible Church because we were members here for a number of years and also because we have had many of you come to Venezuela and um, hang out with us for for a while and do um, short-term mission trips. So that is always so special for us, and we are so thankful for Community Bible Church and for the chance to be back with you today. And um, like Pastor Steve said, we do serve in Caracas, Venezuela with World Venture. Next month, we will celebrate our 28th year there. When we arrived, our oldest daughter was six months old. She was born in language school in Costa Rica. And we also had two more daughters who were born in Venezuela. And um, we are very proud of them. Adriana and Laura, our two older daughters, are both using their Spanish skills as teachers. Adriana just got a job as a high school Spanish teacher, which will be very different from what she was doing teaching elementary in a bilingual school. They are both married. And um, Caroline, our youngest, who's in the middle, is a junior at the University of Arizona studying illustration. So she went the art direction. Um, the last time we were with you, our church in Caracas, which is called El Puente, that means the bridge in Spanish, um, had bought a meeting place in a shopping center, and we were in the process of raising funds so we could remodel it. And we were abundantly provided for by the Lord with the necessary funds, and we went back to Caracas in January of last year. And um, since then, our lives have now become divided into two parts, just like yours. We've got the pre-coronavirus part of our life, and we've got our present reality. So David's going to tell you a little bit about both of those things. Well, when we were here last time with you all, uh, we were raising support uh, or raising funds to finish uh, re actually remodeling the place that we bought. And it has gone well, as you can see through the, in the pictures here. Uh, we, the Lord abundantly provided what we needed to actually finish it, because up to that point we had sort of the bones, we had the structure uh, of the main things there. Um, but uh, we, we, uh, we needed to, to finish that. So we went back in um, January of of 2015, 19. 20, 19, sorry, I, I'm dyslexic, so I get those, no wait, that doesn't explain it, okay, um, uh, we went back, and it was, it was great, because we could just um, intensely uh, do some things there, so when we got back there, this is after, after our last home assignment, we basically had three main pushes that we, uh, that we went for, uh, the first one was to finish the remodeling, and the meeting place, and um, so we, we were able to put in flooring, uh, bathrooms, the sound system, the musical instruments like you have here, the projectors. Uh, we had a, a kitchen uh, installed, uh, window shades, and uh, we also purchased, a, we ordered a portable baptistry that we got from the states. And uh, so that will be able to move around and uh, it'll help us uh, take advantage of our space a little better. And the Lord just really blessed. Uh, it was really hard because uh, getting materials was hard. 
Uh, even toward the end um, of last year, it was getting more and more difficult to get workers in because uh, uh, people could, sometimes couldn't get gas. Uh, sometimes their cars would break down and they couldn't fix them uh, because of the scarcity of car parts. Uh, there's a lot of shortages there. Um, there's sometimes we even went through a shortage of cash at one point where you couldn't get cash because the inflation was so high in the, in the uh, millions. Uh, a second push that we had was to sow abundantly. And this was in the ministry part of our church where we, uh, I encouraged the church to sow abundantly, uh, to, to sow in a sense to do more outreach than you would normally do. And so um, uh, we had more outreach activities, we had more evangelism, and we emphasized discipleship. Um, and uh, we had just a, a ton of activities, which was really neat because now our, you know, our, our, uh, our, uh, build, our meeting place uh, looked nice, and we weren't ashamed to have people come and, and uh, join us. And so in that time, from January of uh, 2019 up until the time uh, COVID hit, our church grew from 12 people up to 48 people. And so we saw the Lord bless, and we had wonderful momentum. And uh, then, um, uh, and one, uh, and but then, then the COVID hit. So that was crazy. Our third emphasis that we had during that time, since we were uh, as a pastor, I wanted to really get the the meeting place together first, and then we were going to start channeling our funds toward a buffer uh, where we would have enough funds where we could begin to build our staff. And uh, really, the first the first step in building staff was for me to get an assistant or associate pastor. And so we, be, we began uh, uh, talking about how we were going to do that, even looking at the possibilities of who, might, who that staff might be. But as you know, in March, uh, the quarantine uh, started and our little church went online like you guys all did. Uh, we, uh, we had actually three weeks there where we scrambled to, to figure out what plan we might have. Uh, online there means very different things than here because the internet there is very low quality. So streaming video was really an impossibility uh, just because uh, so many people don't, they just have, if they have internet, they have just a little bit of Wi-Fi and not enough to where they could, they could actually download videos streaming. So we put our, our sermons up on audio and also our worship on audio, on MP3s that they could, they, so in their home, they can have a service in their home and download the worship songs, the words are there, and then download the sermon and a PowerPoint and just watch it on their computer. And uh, so we do that simultaneously. That was, uh, that was the best we could do. Um, in April, after about three weeks after the quarantine started, we, um, uh, we were advised uh, by the US State Department and in consultation with World Venture, our uh, directors at World Venture, uh, it was uh, decided with uh, the, the Rocky and Sylvia Engels, that you all, Engel, that you all also support, we all had a powwow, and um, uh, just uh, it was for our own safety. Um, it was really time to leave. Uh, as you know, the the relations between U.S. and uh, Venezuela are not at optimal friendliness right now, and so our passport, in a sense, put us in a little more danger. So uh, we decided we would leave, and um, but it's for now. We had we really left with no um, with no date for going back. And at this point, we couldn't go back because all the flights are shut down. Um, but the beauty of that, it was that we could shut our, we could, we could close up our apartment, we could close up the, uh, our meeting place, which is in a shopping center. And so there's, uh, there's a 24 hour um, guards there. So this is secure place. It's paid for the, uh, the um, electricity bills are low. And so basically, uh, we we don't have any uh, real heavy financial uh, burdens right now, so that so it, it's okay to to shut the place down. So that was a benefit. That was a, a blessing. And really, from the here from the states, uh, we can continue to do the online things we were doing there even a little bit more. So we have the sermons, worship songs. We also have Zoom meetings. In fact, if you want to get in on it, in about ten minutes, our fellowship time is starting uh, with our church there at 11:30. Here is 12:30 there. And uh, they, we have our coffee time uh, that we usually have after the service. We have that on Google Meet. And so everybody joins in, and then we take turns sharing prayer requests so that we know how to pray for one another during the week. 
Um, we've actually been able to do Bible studies also on Facebook Live, uh, Google Meet, um, and um, we have a, now a sort of a prayer chain through a, an app that's called WhatsApp, a messaging app. And uh, we've actually been able to do premarital counseling. We did a whole round of premarital counseling for a couple uh, while we were here, taking advantage of they had nothing to do and neither did we. So, uh, so we did the whole thing and they, they really enjoyed it. Um, uh, one of the major blessings that we had really during this time is that the, the crisis gave us an opportunity to accelerate the process of taking on staff. And we have taken on an associate pastor um, and uh, he is a, a friend of mine that I've known for many years, a uh, younger guy, this is him, this is his lead, Rivero, and his wife's name is Wiljor. We, you could just call him Pastor Rivero. And those are his two little kids. And uh, he, uh, he and I have been friends for a number of years, and he was thinking about leaving his church. Part of, part of the reason was his, his church could no longer support him. So many people had left, uh, and many of the pastors are quitting. They're giving up the ministry because they can't feed their families. And so I, we talked with him and we said, look, why don't you consider coming and joining us being an uh, assistant pastor or associate pastor with me, and um, which at, at this point in our lives, in about five or six years, I'm gonna need to retire. And if I had someone working with me, we could phase out and he could take over the church after I leave. And he's a younger guy. And so we're thinking of this as a sort of a strategic relationship. And um, anyway, if you could pray for him, he is basically their, their house sitting or apartment sitting in our apartment because we have better internet and we're also near the church. Uh, so he is helping, helping me pastor the church uh, from there close by. So if you could pray for us, uh, uh, pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ there. Uh, think of the complexities that you're facing right now. There are multiple layers of complexities in Venezuela with the political situation, the shortages, uh, getting gas is difficult even. Uh, the quarantine is much more strict since it's a dictatorship. Uh, what the government says goes, and you can get arrested and put in prison for violating any law they, they make. And so um, it's, a, it's a difficult time, and so people are mostly homebound. But pray for them that just for that they would that they would continue to have courage, that they would continue to have faith in the Lord, that they would not lose their faith uh, during this time, and uh, pray for us that we could safely return to Caracas um, when international flights reopen again. At this point, we're thinking it probably will not be this year. Uh, just uh, looking at the rate, things are are happening there. Uh, finally, we just want to thank you for your partnership. Uh, we have such a wonderful relationship uh, with this congregation. Uh, we had the privilege of really being part of the founding of this church. Uh, we were here in the early years uh, and just have some dear friendships here. And, uh, and when it was possible, you all set us people. And we love receiving your funds <laughs> to help pay for our expenses, but we really love when your people uh, join in. And that we have, you had many, many trips that you, uh, uh, of all our churches, you all uh, sent us people. And that says something a, a lot to our people there, that you, you care enough to send people. And so we just, uh, we thank you for your, uh, for your prayers, for your partnership, and uh, just for joining in with seeing uh, lives transformed by Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Our scripture reading is uh, Luke 7, 1 through 17. And I want to backtrack just a bit, just to remind you where we came from. And that we, uh, Jesus was talking to the crowd, and he gave that um, parable, which is great. And it was only meant for me about the, taking a speck out of your eye, but I can't quite see because I got the log in my own. And then he went on to talk about uh, foundation. Like don't build a house just on ground, have sturdy foundation, which is great because it's also our dreams, our ideas, our perspectives should be on solid ground. 
So that's what he said before. And then he said, Scripture says, when he had completed all this discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And a centurion slave, who was highly regarded by him, was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further. For I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Soon afterward, he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now as he approached the gate at the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd from the city was with him, with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus, Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped all of them. And they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us. And God has visited his people. This report concerning him went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding district. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we come to you in Jesus' name. We just ask you for, for your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and get our minds open and be receptive as Pastor Steve comes up and shares your vision and your interpretation through him of this scripture. We thank you for the peace. We thank you for the freedom that we have here. All this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Cliff. And thank you, David and Jereen, for presenting about your work and your ministry today. We really appreciate all that you do. And mostly we're just thankful for the, the lives you live, the people that you are, your love for Jesus, and how that radiates from you. So thank you so much. I have just learned that our, our youth group on their travels are actually joining in and watching us live. So hello, youth group on the youth missions trip. We are happy to welcome you to your own worship service today. <laughs> <coughs> well, this little tickle cough is here, still here. It was much better throughout the week. I thought it was almost gone, and then it decided to come back last night and then also today. So <coughs> I do apologize. Um, so um, we're going through a time in our uh, society where one particular word has lost its meaning, authority. In some places in America, authority is being abused or misused or undermined or attacked or simply tossed out the window and is creating chaos. So here's a principle worth living your life by. A wise person figures out who the authority is, and instead of trying to go around that authority, he brings himself under 
that authority. That's a wise person. That person is going to have a whole lot more success in life, a whole lot more, oh, I'm supposed to dismiss the kids to junior church, I'm sorry. They're leaving, with, they're leaving without me, they're just going, so great. Um, a whole lot more successful in life, a whole lot more things go their way than the person who bucks authority or who defies authority. That's just how life works. Ask the prisoner who is behind bars. Ask the athlete who gets suspended or disqualified for breaking the rules or for using some forbidden substance. Ask the soldier who gets demoted for disobeying um, an order of a, of a commander. Ask any unruly student who gets kicked out of school. Ask any child who gets spanked. Ask any teenager who gets grounded or has his smartphone removed. Ask any employee who gets fired. Each of those people ran into an authority and that authority dealt with their bad behavior or their poor performance. Best not to do that. How much better to identify said authorities in your life and, and live a good life under that authority? And there are a ton of Bible verses that tell us to do just that. But sadly, there, there are times, as we have seen in, in uh, the recent years, when the various people in authority over us don't treat us as they ought, aren't fair or equitable with us, or can even be destructive and harmful in various ways. Ask the actress who was sexually assaulted by the Hollywood director or producer. Ask the parent who learned that their child was molested by a teacher at school. Ask the college professor who was fired for not towing the party line. Ask the store owner in Seattle whose store got burned down by some protesters, but the, the mayor wouldn't send in the police to protect his place of business. There, there are lots of things happening that we are watching and experiencing from those supposedly in authority over us that shows a whole lot of confusion about their authority or the misuse of their authority or even the abuse of their authority. Authority as a guiding principle of society is in disarray. Have you experienced someone in authority over you misuse or abuse that authority? It's a pretty painful thing, isn't it? <coughs> in whatever area that you are the person in authority, have you ever misused or abused that authority? Have you neglected that authority or abdicated your authority when others were counting on you? I have. Uh, let me grab a sip of water. Thank you, Matt. I have, and I get to tell you a story about that. You, you know, I've always felt loved and appreciated and valued and esteemed by you, my CBC family. But the story that I am about to tell is an opportunity for your esteem of me to go down in your mind. <laughs> this is one of those Pastor Steve did what <laughs> moments. But it happened 25 years ago, and hopefully I've matured since then and learned some valuable lessons. But it's, it's a very intriguing story. <laughs> 25 years ago, Jan and I were invited to learn about a timeshare. Uh, so we, we got there and we were welcomed very warmly and we sat through a, a group presentation and then we met with a salesperson who showed us a big notebook with pictures of beautiful vacation destinations. <coughs> and they explained that if we bought the package that we'd actually be considered owners of the company. And all the people who buy in to this are co-owners of the company. I didn't know what that meant, if we maybe got some sort of profit-sharing bonus at the end of the year, or what that might mean. But it sounded nice to be an owner. They were, I'm sure, just saying nice things anyway. And then there were other perks that they tossed in as well, if we bought today, of course. Well, we, we were interested. It, it required a pretty sizable upfront payment, but we talked it over and agreed to take the plunge. We signed on the bottom line, and we were timeshare owners. Which, of course, means that I have been the recipient of hundreds of timeshare phone calls for years. Sell your timeshare, trade your timeshare, get out of your timeshare, upgrade your timeshare. Truth is, those timeshare phone calls are my punishment for what you're about to hear. <laughs> we signed up, got our welcome packet, and went home to immediately get on their website and start making vacation plans. Well, the places that we wanted to go didn't have any availability at the nice beachfront condos in their photo album that they'd shown us. All they had were places that were a whole lot less attractive several blocks away from the beach. We tried other places, other dates, same result. Hmm, this is not working out well. We checked some reviews of the company and found that lots of people were having the same experience and they were as upset as I was getting. So I went back the next day to get our money back. <clears throat> 
The person at the front desk went to get a manager who came up and showed me the fine print and said that there were no refunds. I'd signed a contract and that was it, no backing out. He was adamant and he wasn't very happy that I was even there asking for the refund. <laughs> so I said, in, in the presentation the other day, I was told that, that if I bought in that I would be an owner. Is that right? Yes, that's true. Well, excuse me just a moment. So I left him and I walked over to the adjoining waiting room where at least 30 people were waiting for the next presentation so they could sign up. And I went to the front of the room and introduced myself and said, I am one of the owners here and I need to tell you that this is a bad deal. You don't want to do this. We tried to book a nice place that they would show you in the brochure, but there's no availability and all they had was this cheap looking place blocks away from the beach. And, and about when I got those words out, five or six guys came up and hauled me out of the room. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, you said that I was a prospective owner, so I was just giving them a, 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 an update to prospective clients. Well, they were really, really upset with me, <laughs> but I had a full refund in five minutes. <laughs> That is an abuse of authority. <laughs> was I really an owner? No, <laughs> they were just saying nice things. Did I use that to get my way? Yes. Was I childish and immature and rude? Yes. Am I glad to be out of my timeshare? Yes. <laughs> but because we had been one time timeshare owner for just a couple of days, it meant that I was put on their phone list forever and that list has evidently been sold to every other timeshare company in the world and 25 years of timeshare sales calls is my punishment. They'll call up, I'm calling today about your timeshare. I don't have a timeshare. Oh, I wonder how you got on my list. Funny story, got a moment? <laughs> But that was a long time ago, and hopefully I have learned some things. <coughs> Authority is a very important principle in the home, in society, in all kinds of areas of our lives. And our world is clearly struggling with authority right now, what it means, how to do it well, <coughs> how to do, uh, what to do when authority is used poorly. We're struggling to deal with that as a society. So I think it's very helpful that at this time in our culture to come to a Bible passage that deals with authority, the proper understanding of authority, the proper respect for authority, and certainly the proper use of authority, which I did not do. And we find exactly that in Luke chapter 7. We're going through the Gospel of Luke. We finished chapter 6. We're starting chapter 7. And we come across this beautiful story that speaks directly to the topic of authority. It's the story of the centurion who had a servant who was ill. <clears throat> and my prayer is that this wonderful example in the Bible will inform us about how we should approach those in authority over us, and, or even how we should utilize our God-given authority for those whom God has placed in our care. And certainly the passage will speak to how we are to respond to the Lord Jesus, who is Lord of all and who is the highest authority over all, because the second half of the passage today shows, that Je shows Jesus raising somebody from the dead, unasked, no faith, no real knowledge of who Jesus even is. But the Lord Jesus, who will himself soon conquer death in the grave, has compassion on this grieving mother and raises her son back to life again. How's that for authority? So if you find yourself struggling with how to deal with your parents or your teachers or your boss or the government, or maybe this morning for some reason you're struggling with God himself, this passage has some important things to say to you. It is a great passage on authority. As Cliff mentioned, Jesus has just finished the Sermon on the Plain and he's headed back to, into the town of Capernaum, which is right on the Sea of Galilee. And as was read for us, there was a centurion who had a servant, it says a highly regarded servant, one, one that the, the centurion evidently cared for, had relied on, was, had valued, who was now sick, evidently to the point of, or at the point of death. Well, this centurion had somehow heard uh, about Jesus, about his teaching, his miracles, his healings. We're not sure what all he knew, but he sent some folks to Jesus to ask for help. Now, this centurion could have sent just about anybody he wanted, but he was very specific about who he chose to go and speak with Jesus. He sent Jewish elders. A Roman centurion is sending Jewish elders to go talk to Jesus. So right from the start, this centurion is respecting Jesus' religious background and faith. He's reaching out to Jesus from a point of common bond. These men would believe as Jesus believed and would share a common heritage. That, that shows a lot of respect, which, of course, is 
a good first step when it comes to how to approach authority. This man shows a lot of forethought and care. He wasn't dismissive of the Jews. He didn't just assume that a Roman centurion could just demand things of Jesus as, as he wanted. He showed respect. He sent people who could relate and connect well to Jesus, and that's important. It's also our first hint that this centurion puts great value on the authority that he believes that Jesus has. So these Jewish elders go and find Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and they share with him about the centurion and his servant who is ill. And it's significant, very significant, how the, these Jewish elders describe the centurion whom they evidently know well. They say in verses 4 to 5, he, he is worthy of you to grant this to him. Well, who says that about a despised Roman? And the Romans were their captors. The Romans had, had conquered the land. They, they were occupiers of, of, the, of the promised land of Israel. The Jews didn't want the Romans around. They wanted the Romans gone. They were waiting for a Messiah to come deliver them from the oppressive Romans. And, and here these guys say, this Roman soldier, this centurion, he is worthy of you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation, and he, it is he who built us our synagogue. So what Roman soldier does that? Builds the local synagogue for the Jews. So there are several, several very unusual aspects to this centurion as the story unfolds. He's, he's clearly different than what you'd expect. And, and Jesus doesn't hesitate. He immediately starts off with them to the centurion's house. But as they draw near, the centurion sent other people, friends, uh, is what's described here, friends of his, to go speak with Jesus. So picture Jesus just, I don't know, a block or two away. He's, he's close. But the centurion has sent his friends to go speak with Jesus. Uh, at that distance. And that's very interesting. The centurion doesn't go out and meet Jesus himself, he, and he doesn't invite Jesus into his home. And at first we might think that this Roman soldier was too proud, too above having a Jew in his home. But that isn't the case at all. Just the opposite, in fact. Th this man has his friends tell Jesus in verses 6 and 7, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. Well, that tells us a whole lot about this centurion. He didn't think that he was worthy to go out and meet Jesus in person. He didn't think he was worthy to have Jesus come into his home. This man has a very humble view of himself, which would have been quite unusual. And he had a very exalted view of Christ. You remember that the scriptures have a whole lot to say about humility. Things like humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will exalt you. Over and over we find ourselves, we find God on the side of the humble. All the time God is exalting the humble and not the proud. <coughs> but this woman's in train was humble, a humble man. That's very evident. What isn't evident for us is where he got his great respect for Jesus. We're not given that part of the backstory, but it but it's clear as can be that that's his attitude. Jesus is so much greater that this centurion isn't even worthy to meet him. Instead he says to Jesus through his friends, just say the word. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. He, he has no doubt. He's completely confident that this person that he's never met, just heard some things about, can actually heal his servant from a distance just by speaking the word. That's faith. <laughs> but he had that kind of faith because he understood the level of authority that Jesus had. Just say the word. And my servant will be healed because you have the authority to make that happen. And then the, the, the centurion even uses his own authority to make his point. I am a man with authority, with, with soldiers under me. And I, I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. So he's fully aware of how authority works. Those under your authority are to do what you say. They follow your directives. You're in charge. You're the authority. And this Roman soldier evidently had the faith to believe that Jesus has authority not just over people, not just over servants, but over health, wellness, sickness, disease. If you just say the word, he will be healed. Wow. It's so startling that Jesus responds in verse 9. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him. And by the way, it's probably a really short list of people that Jesus marveled at. But he marveled at this guy. 
Jesus marveled at him and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. That's a pretty big statement. Not among the disciples, not among any of the religious leaders, not Nicodemus, not Peter, James, and John, not Mary Magdalene, no one. Jesus has just said that this Roman centurion exhibited greater faith than any person in all of Israel. And when his friends returned to the, the centurion's home, they found that the servant had been healed. Jesus unhesitatingly honored his faith. And we could easily spend a whole sermon talking about this man's faith. But our focus this morning is on authority. And what we see here is that authority is quickly defined and acknowledged and it is submitted to. The soldiers obeyed what the centurion commanded them to do. And the illness that the servant had did what the Lord Jesus commanded it to do. Authority was recognized and it was submitted to. That's a great way to follow Jesus. Last week, we looked at the statement that Je where Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And the problem there is we're giving Jesus the title of authority, Lord, but we're not fully acknowledging that authority and submitting to it. So having just challenged the people with that statement, Jesus steps right into the situation with the Roman centurion and explains very clearly exactly how authority ought to work. Jesus has all authority. So the, that the wind obeys him, sickness and disease obey him, and we are to obey him. And next we learn that even the dead obey him. Jesus traveled from there to Nain along with his disciples and a large crowd following him. And then beginning in verses 12 to 15, let me read this again for us. <coughs> now as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, so she was alone, all alone now. <clears throat> and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Now, we can talk about the miracle itself, how, how no one in the crowd seemed to know who Jesus was. No one, not even the mother, went to find Jesus and ask for his help. Jesus just steps in and raises her son from the dead. There's, there's no faith being exhibited here, like, unlike the centurion who had great faith. There's not even a request, a plea for help. They evidently have no idea who Jesus is or what he can do. But the Lord Jesus, full of love and compassion, steps in and raises the young man from the dead. It's amazing. But what it shows is authority, even authority over death. There's no limit to Jesus' authority. He even declares that to be true when he gives the Great Commission where he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Well, that settles it. That leaves no doubt. He had full authority to create the universe. He had full authority to defeat Satan in the wilderness. He had authority to walk on water, calm the wind and the seas, multiply fish and bread to feed thousands, heal a leper, give sight to the blind, cause a lame to walk. He had authority to raise the dead. He had authority to bear our sins on the cross. He had authority to forgive give us of everything we've ever done. He had authority to rise gloriously from the tomb. And one day, he's coming back with all authority to judge the living and the dead. All authority. I don't know what the centurion knew about Jesus, but he knew enough to say, just say the word and my servant will be healed. Just a side note, this is a bit of a tangent, but the past few decades or so, there's been a, a movement in some churches called name it, claim it. Just name it, speak it. Claim it is true and God will do it. Claim health, claim wealth, Claim a happy marriage, claim whatever. Just speak it, just claim it, it will be done. That's not quite right. It doesn't really matter if I say the word. It matters what Jesus says, what Jesus declares. The centurion had it right. He didn't just say, he didn't say to Jesus, I've claimed, I've claimed that this servant will be healed. Nope, he said, you just say the word. 
If Jesus speaks it, if Jesus speaks it, it is done. And the crowd that saw this miracle knew it. Jesus spoke it, and the dead person sat up and began speaking. They had just witnessed an unparalleled display of authority. And you can see it in their reaction, verse 16. Fear gripped them all. And they began glorifying God and saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. Fear gripped them because no one had ever seen such a display of authority. Authority even to raise the dead. They believed that God had visited them. Jesus did that in seven words. Young man, I say to you, arise. He spoke the word, all authority. Now that that's settled, now that we know that Jesus has all authority, authority to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to forgive sins, to judge the living and the dead, now that we know that, now that that's settled, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? If all authority has been given him in heaven and on earth, it would seem that his followers, his servants, would simply respond to their Lord, just say the word. Just say the word. Just say the word. And I'm pretty sure if we respond properly to the authority of Jesus in our lives, he will help us respond properly to the other authorities in our lives as well, to parents, to teachers, to law enforcement, to government, and so on. Not that any of those people in authority are perfect. They're not. Only Jesus but as we live for Jesus in this world, as we represent Jesus in this world, that shapes and determines how we respect and value and honor those whom God has placed in authority over us. But it begins, it begins with what we do with Jesus, the one who has all authority. May the attitude of our heart toward the Lord Jesus always be just to say the word. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for these two stories of our Lord Jesus healing the sick and raising the dead. We marvel at who you are, O Son of God. We marvel and we bow in wonder and worship. Thank you, Father, that... Uh, your call, your challenge to us is to submit fully to your authority in our lives because you have all authority. You, you reign supreme. There is none like you. There's none. It's you alone. You alone who are the Lord God. You are alone who are creator and Lord of all, master, sovereign ruler of the universe. You are the authority. And Father, as we live out our lives in these complicated times, these difficult and challenging days. I pray that as we live for Jesus and as we follow the example of how you call us to live, I pray, Father, that we will demonstrate the, the kind of response to authority that um, a child of yours would, would exhibit. I thank you that we see disciples stumble and fall with that and trip over themselves as they try to figure out what that means. But they got there. They learned, they grew, they became better at that. We see others in the pages of Scripture, Father, who, who did so well, responding to authority, and especially the, the authority of you in their life, but, but other authorities that you placed over them as well. And, and we want to honor you by how we honor those in authority. And so I pray for us, Father, that as we see the principle of authority under attack in our world, I pray that we would do as you call us to do as your people and respond first and above all to you in submission to your authority. But also, also Father, that would be reflected and shaped in how we respond to others. I pray, Father, we will have the attitude that Jesus had, the attitude of a servant, of one who came humbly to serve and care for others. I thank you, Father, that um, through this, your desire is for you to be glorified. And so we pray, Father, that our lives will be lived by the principle of not I, but Christ, as we submit to you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thank you, Steve. Um, I want to take an opportunity at, as we close the service to sing this hymn very simply. And by that, I mean without other instruments, um, because I want to give you an opportunity to think about what these words are saying. I know you, you do that, um, but even this time to the point where if you have trouble thinking and singing at the same time, I encourage you to not sing. Uh, if you could put the first slide up, the first uh, line, uh, Be Thou My Vision, is this hymn. Some of the language here, as is, is, is normal for uh, many hymns, is uh, sort of unconventional for us. It says, Be Thou My Vision. In other words, as a prayer, Lord, be what I seek. Be my sight. Help me see. There's multiple ways we can we can understand this, but be be what I um, the goal of my life, right? Uh, o Lord of my heart, as we were just discussing and listening to in, the, in this passage in Luke. O Lord of what of my heart, the very essence and center of who we are, right? Not be all else to me, save that Thou art. In other words, you be the first and the only one that I <laughs> that is my my focus in my life. So not be all else as in there is nothing else uh, that compares uh, to, to him. So, so there's, there's a priority uh, idea here in this line. So, so as we sing the song, just do your best to think through what, what in the world these words are saying. Even. Uh, so if you would like to stand, you're welcome to. If you'd like to just sit, um, you're welcome to do that as well. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, say that thou art, thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping.
Thank you for joining us.